In this mini-series, we're interviewing a group of the largest institutional allocators, also known as the super allocators, to understand how these immense pools of capital think about the assets they invest in, shifting asset allocations, passive v active, public v private, and steering through turbulent waters. Are they akin to super tankers who must accept that size brings inevitable slowness to respond, or in fact, can they be much more adept than imagined? To help us form a clearer picture and to understand similarities and dissimilarities, we're going to talk to Carlsters in California, the Australia Future Fund, and Ontario Teachers. And in discussions with their CEOs and CIOs, I hope we'll end up better informed and understand the approaches in managing such pools of capital with very real and dependent beneficiaries. So we go to Sacramento. And with Christopher Aylman, the Chief Investment Officer of the $300 billion Californian State Teachers Retirement System, I believe I'm right in saying the largest educator-only pension fund in the world and the second largest pension fund in the US. So, Christopher, welcome to the Money Miss Podcast. Hey, thank you. It's a delight to be here. I appreciate the opportunity. Great. Well, it's been said that you have helped transform the California State Teachers Retirement System from a somewhat sleepy pension fund into a $300 billion institutional investing juggernaut. But before we talk about Culsters, let's talk about Christopher Aylman. You were educated and grew up, I think, in California. I'm sitting in a cold, wet, grim London where it's January and it's still dark when you arrive at work. Did you ever think you'd been born in the wrong place? <laughs> Uh, no, I enjoy California. Gotta love it. Um, I, I have had the opportunity to move out of state. I worked up in the state of Washington, ran their pension plans for a period of time, which is just absolutely beautiful. The Northwest of America is gorgeous. Certainly love Canada, but I have to say, while I have visited London uh, a bunch of times, I like it in May and June, but uh, not so much in January or February, or actually, sadly, the rest of the year. <laughs> One of the questions we uh, we like to ask sometimes is, how did you earn your first dollar? Gosh, how far back do I go? Um, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I uh, out of school, you had to realize I went to college uh, before PCs, uh, and I was very interested in in investments and management. Computers were just coming out. I thought I wanted to be in corporate management. My university had a great accounting series, so I focused in more on being an accountant. And back then, uh, there was a big eight. Uh, now, obviously, the big four, but had an opportunity to invest uh, to interview with them and realized that that auditing and some of the jobs are are pretty mundane. But I had been exposed at that point to Wall Street, so kind of a long winded answer. You know, I, I started on the small institutional side, doctors, hospitals, uh, nonprofits, uh, but then got the opportunity to move to government. And I really only thought I would stay in government for a brief period. Uh, but I, it really surprised me and I found that it suited my lifestyle. You know, my first uh, money in, uh, and dollar earned really had to be from being uh, exposed to the equity market. I had been in this business. I, before the title of chief investment officer existed. So all the way back in 1985, and I have been through numerous booms and busts in areas like real estate, the birth of private equity, diversification of portfolios. Back then we called it US and non-US equities. Just a lot of interesting transitions. Uh, and I was one of those people that was fortunate to start young and then grow with the industry. Uh, so. I've been blessed by the chance to be at, at, at a small fund, then moved to the state of Washington, which uh, at the time was about the 30th largest fund and run that portfolio, famous for private equity. So I really got exposed to uh, some of the early investments in the early 90s uh, to private equity. And then came to, to CalSTRS, California Teachers, uh, in the year 2000. Uh, and surprisingly to me and them, I've stayed. Uh, I had committed to be, I uh, uh, told the board when I interviewed, I'd be their longest serving CIO. And I've stayed uh, longer than even I expected, but I love it. And, you know, part of it is, and you hit on it, we're an educator only fund. So we have a very unique membership of just uh, over a million, believe it or not, public school teachers in the state of California. 
And uh, my sister is a retired teacher. My sister-in-law is now a retired teacher. And my daughter is a teacher. So I can very much relate to our mission and, uh, and who we're serving. So I think I'm right in saying that this fund started in 1913. So that's a lot of that's a lot of history. How does a you know what was the genesis and what was the thinking and I suppose also why has it managed to remain one unitary vehicle? Well, I'm old, but thankfully I'm not that old that I was there when they started the fund. But you know, it's interesting. I've studied pension plans and and teacher plans were among the first started. And so for the listeners, they've got to realize that's before Social Security was created in the USA. 1913 is really early, but it was the realization that teachers, mostly women, worked their entire career in the field of teaching and that they deserved some kind of retirement pension. You know, think about the lifespan in 1913. It was literally pay as you go because the liabilities were not that great. But it really was started uh, and designed primarily for women. And one of the things that's changed is longevity. Uh, Once a California teacher reaches the age of 60, so they got to get to 60. But once they get there, a teacher in California lives longer than any other worker in America. It is amazing. Wow. That is interesting. Well, there is a great book called The Hundred Year Life that was written by some London Business School professors that talks about it. But I think it sounds like it was written for, uh, for, 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 for your beneficiaries. As we're talking today, you'll be stunned to know that we have over 425 teachers, beneficiaries on the, on the uh, retirement payroll that are over 100 years old. So it is stunning. But, you know, they live in, back to your first question of why California, they live in California which means they tend to eat healthier. I know Britain's known for its gardens, but out here we have a lot of fresh vegetables, farm to fork, and the uh, they're not non-smokers and you know they're college educated, so they just live healthier lifestyles. And I think that's a big attribution of why they live so long. So it's amazing. Longevity is a real challenge for me. Well, Britain may be known for its gardens, but it's not known for its healthy eating. So, so, so you may have been looking at some select groups of people when you visited London. Bangers and mash isn't healthy. <laughs> Calsters, on arriving there in 2000, how did you prioritize your vision? Whenever you take over, and you made the expression or the analogy at the beginning of a tanker ship, I like to think of us as a, a cruise boat, a big part, big uh, carnival cruise line or something. A lot more fun than a tanker. Um, the first thing you have to do is to get to know the ship. You have to know the portfolio. Uh, you have to understand the nooks and crannies in the portfolio. Why is it built the way it's built at that time? Because even I, I really believe unless you understand the past, it's hard to move forward. There was already an existing team, so I had to understand their history and culture, what they had been through. And then what I did is really sit down and and I set a goal. We were sleepy, as you described. We we were hidden. Uh, I mean, literally the, the name of the fund wasn't even on the building, so people didn't even know we were in, in the cap, state capital. But my goal was to really make us a world-class money manager. And that had a lot of analogies, a lot of definitions, but it meant that we were managing some of the money. We had a global reputation and we were at, at the time the third largest fund in the USA, but I really wanted to take us out of the shadows and establish us as a presence. It's a personal thing, but it has always bothered me that around the world, when you say the teachers fund, Nine out of 10, they're going to mention, as you described, Ontario teachers. You know, we're three times, two times their size. No one mentions California teachers. So uh, I really, it was kind of a personal goal. I have to say, uh, prior to my coming, and I knew Calsters because I had worked in this town before running the county retirement system. So I knew the staff and I, and I knew the fund well. Historically, it had been a third and unfortunately, mostly fourth quartile fund in the 80s and the 90s. And I knew what the major cause of that was, which was asset allocation, big asset allocation bets into bonds, away from stocks. And anybody that looks at the 80s and 90s knows it was a big bull market time. So I knew just stabilizing the asset allocation was the first key and then building out the rest of the team. So. 
Uh, you know, it was, I think when anybody takes something over, this is just general management advice, you really have to do your homework and your due diligence on, on why is it in the position it's in, whether a team is a leader or struggling, and then you've got to figure out what are your resources, what tools do you have, what budget do you have, uh, and, and find your niche. Um, uh, what I think about, and I'm not an expert on British Premier League, uh, but some of those smaller teams know how hard it is for them to build up talent and, and they can't go out and buy an all-star very easily. But how do they compete consistently so that they're at the, above the qualifying line? Um, and I think you just have to, I set a long-term plan and, I, and the big thing is the staff had just been through a CIO turnover and a real sharp division. Um, was unify them and pledge, as I said earlier, to the board and to them, I was going to be around for a fairly long time. I had said to the board I would be there for at least 15 years and stuck by my word. And I think that was uh, important for the team at the time. Think about management turnover in an orchestra, Premier League, anything. When you have management turnover, tends to lead to chaos and the team does not perform at its best. Right. Now, you've touched on asset allocation, and that's really where I'd like to pick up the thread because there is a liability sitting in your business, unlike some. Uh, and there are two components we've often talked about in this world, which is a strategic asset allocation and a tactical allocation. So maybe you could just explain how you balance those two, um, those two competing forces. I don't look at them as competing forces. I look at them as sort of... Uh, uh, long-term guide and then short-term shifts. Um, you know, I think, look at ourselves personally in our lives. We all have long-term goals, but then we have to make day-to-day -day and year-to-year, month-to-month uh, shifts along the way. Um, but we stay true to those long-term goals. So to me, the strategic asset allocation is set by the board. They look at that liability stream. They know what the contributions are because the retirement system is pretty simple. There's contributions and there's investment income. Those two together have to pay the benefit. And sometimes your benefits are flexible, which is great, but in ours, they are carved in stone. Uh, so they really only have two levers. And in fact, in ours, the, the contribution lever to use an example, an analogy, are really set in soft cement. So they're very hard to move. So it really becomes the investment goal. And that's so long-winded answer, but you have to understand where that strategic asset allocation comes from. It comes from that long-term perspective. And you said we're, we're kind of unique and challenged. Think of us as a 35-year-old career school teacher. So somebody who says, you know, I'm going to teach my whole life. Uh, but they're about 35, so they've earned some money, but they have a long way to go. And, and in our fund, as I said, they could live to 100. So they're going to live for that money for a long time. So I'm blessed with a chance to have a long horizon, uh, invest that money in a number of ways. And as I said earlier, the fund had taken some pretty significant asset allocation bets, sadly, mostly wrong, not all, but mostly wrong in the 80s and 90s. So my goal was to actually stick close to home, not take asset allocation bets. And, and personally, I'm not a big believer in market timing. Uh, I've done it and it's been wrong. Um, it is nearly impossible to pick even close to the tops and bottoms of markets. Uh, so when, I, when the board adopted an asset allocation after I got there, I actually tightened down the ranges on the strategic asset allocation. Uh, so to give you an example, there are some funds in the USA that say their target for global equity is 50%. They may have a range as wide as, as low as 20 and as high as 70. Big asset allocation bet. The traditional book, if you open a CFA book or a traditional university book, it will tell you the range should be plus or minus five. I narrowed it to plus or minus 3% so that we could shift the boat a little, but we really had to stay true to course and, and aim for that horizon. So to me, again, I don't look at them as strategic and tactical as being opposites. I look at them as 
the strategic is your long-term horizon. Say it's your point on the, you know, I'll go back to your, your big ship analogy. The board has picked a point on the horizon and I have to aim for it. Uh, the challenge is I never go to port. So I can't hide in a storm. I can only batten down the hatches and tie down everything in a storm. I've got to ride through it. But instead of taking big tax on that boat and trying to make changes, and in your analogy, you, you take tax on a big ship, you waste time, gas, you get nowhere. Um, I've got to just uh, stick close to that. So historically, we have uh, not made big wagers on the asset allocation. Uh, we've done those tilts as what I would describe them. Plus, you have to manage cash flow. Uh, now, in my analogy of a 35-year-old teacher, they're not going to draw on the money until they're 55, 62 in France, maybe 65 in France if it gets away with it. Um, but they're, they're not going to draw on the money for a long time. In our case, we are a mature plan, so we do have a negative cash flow, so I have to plan for that. Instead of average cost buying in, I have, it, I have to average cost selling out. Um, so that becomes an important decision. Uh, again, it's nuanced, but it, and I'm getting technical on the portfolio, but it really becomes an important decision between strategic and tactical. Uh, you've got to find a way to always be raising that cash flow. Got it. So I've actually dissected your five and 10 year numbers that you publish. And so I'd like to actually look at some of these assets. Let's just start with fixed income, because um, we're going to talk when we get to equity about passive versus equity, but, you, but you've had some outperformance in the world of fixed income and as I look at the long-term series. Just tell me a little bit how you've achieved that. Can I get super technical? I hope the audience doesn't mind that. Yes, but, yes, yes, yes. You know, when you, when you think about active and passive, a lot has to do with the benchmark you're trying to outperform. And I work with MSCI and I've worked with uh, FTSE Russell in the past as well. The equity benchmarks measure the entire universe, are very accurate, have no cost, and are very challenging. And this isn't to disrespect the fixed income team who does an awesome job, but the fixed income benchmark by its definition is a measurement of everyone that issues debt. Well, that's not the optimal bench, op, optimal measurement. You, you don't want to have the most money with people who need to borrow the most. You know, the old adage, you want to loan money to people who don't really need it. Um, so I think, you know, when you look at the indices, there are some that are just already made up that, you know, I think smart people can, can beat it fairly consistently. Now, that said, we have an awesome team and they have absolutely beaten the benchmark absolutely consistently. In fixed income, the old adage is, is you have credit, you don't mess with duration uh, because it's really hard to figure out the direction of interest rates. Well, in fact, you're not being too technical because we had because we had Greg Peters of PGM uh, back in the autumn, and he really talked about that benchmark issue and 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 you know why it's not always representative. So that's helpful. Um, I want to just talk about equities again. You might correct me, but from what I can understand, seventy percent of the fund stock allocation is passive, and that a lot of that has happened on your watch. Um, and when I looked at the outperformance, not surprisingly. There wasn't much in equity, direct equity. You know, this is, I think, particularly now such an interesting time to talk about alpha versus beta. Now, I was reading a UK firm called Phoenix Asset Management. I happen to have been invested with them for a long time. Very successful long-term fund, multi-decade alpha. And I read the Gary Chan and the PM. He says, there are two edges a value-based approach has over index tracking, which should mean all value managers can outperform the index after fees if they do them. Number one, avoid bubbles and overvaluation. And number two, take advantage of troughs of undervaluation of course, both go against human instinct. I just want to start by understanding how you weigh up that tension between active and passive. Well, and I, I want to present a, a, a balanced point of view here, uh, simply because uh, my point of view, my my view is is very leans very heavy on passive, and I get attacked by active managers. So. Part of it is you've got to understand as an investor, where are you coming from? What can you get access to? And what's the best, and we're all about net return here. So what's the bet net, net cost uh, way to, to grab the return? I'm sure there are active managers that perform very well, but they also tend to pick their clients. They also tend to be very expensive. 
Um, and and can they outperform consistently? I have seen active managers outperform for four years and then near five and six lose all that alpha. So I just I think it's really a challenge. And, and oftentimes when I run into high net worth, like yourself or other people who have investments with active managers and say they're they're getting alpha, uh, they're fairly small funds. So they don't fit my size. Keep in mind, you know, I, I'm over one hundred and fifty billion dollars in global equity. So I need absolute size. I'm also a governmental entity and my entire career. So I've been a public fund CIO for over 35 years. All of the funds I worked at were public entities. So they had government contracts, which doesn't tick a rock science to figure out that's not the best contract for asset management. And the way we had to hire them was basically putting a, a billboard out on the highway to try and a attract them. Uh, so from my perspective, uh, whether it was my smaller fund where I started, the state of Washington or CalSTRS, it's been very hard to hire and keep active management. Uh, and I can get the beta of the market at zero cost. And now I can run it internal with my own team who then can do a lot of other things for us. Uh, and obviously when you add in securities lending, you, you've got a return. So. I can run billions and billions of dollars against an index. And oh, by the way, we'll probably outperform by 10 to 12 basis points, nothing to an active manager, but on $50 billion, 10 basis points is a huge sum of money, net, net again, not net, without fees. So I, I look at what I have, my structure, what I'm required uh, by law to follow certain things, and I realized, you know, active management is too expensive, too inconsistent, and I can't get access to these small, private, niche managers that, that people tell me about. Uh, they won't do business with us on our terms. They have to, you have to do business on their terms, which aren't acceptable to us. So uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of passive simply because you can, uh, you know, when you look at the overall pension plan, the global equity segment is my largest asset class, and I need to get the beta of that market. We assume over a very long period of time that the equity market will return somewhere between eight and nine, because historically it has. I need that return, uh, and I'm not willing to take a lot of risks. So if I can get that return at no cost to me, I'm going to lock that in and then take my alpha risk in other areas where I think it's, it's I got a better chance of having it generated uh, in private markets, uh, in fixed income and other areas. So I'm all about return. That's all I, that's what I get to focus on. That is my sole job. Uh, so I'm gonna go passive, I'm gonna lock it in. And to me, I think that is by far the most efficient. I mean, just good grief, look in 2020. Uh, at, the, at the end of 21, everyone was celebrating the ARC Fund and Kathy Wood as this absolute genius. Um, and at the end of 22, it's 100% it's the opposite. I mean, you went from one extreme to the other uh, without even stopping in the middle. And unfortunately, that's what I've seen is the life of active management. Uh, one more technical point, you know, the historical study, you know, the work by Pharma French, that value is the best place to invest. Yet, in 2001 and two, we said value was dead. We said Warren Buffett was an idiot, uh, we being the industry. Uh, and then here we are in, in 22 and 21, and again, value is dead. Um, yet we know historically that's actually the best place to be. It's really hard to pick between value and growth, value and growth, to know if it's different this time. Um, and I think that's why retail investors have a real challenge when they go to active management let me put it this way. I have said that active management is going to lose its license to operate, social license to operate, simply because they charge too high a fee for the service they provide. If you look at active managers, we know the story. Two thirds of them don't outperform the market net of fees. If you take that fee away or, or could reduce that fee, you dramatically improve their ability to outperform the market. Before fees, most active managers, uh, on average, more than half, do outperform the market. But when you add in their fee cost and their fee load, 
it's stacked against you. So I think you have defended your corner eloquently, and and and, and, and it's difficult to disagree. Of course, the irony is the, that the U.S. being probably the deepest and the most efficient capital market, you know, the room for alpha is less than when you travel to smaller markets. Now, just before we leave listed equity, you're obviously not a hundred percent passive, so you are you are selecting within that universe other managers. Just tell me a little bit about what the mandate is to those in your team who are doing it because you're you, I'm imagining you're giving them more rain because of this huge weight in passive. Yeah, I have a, a foot on each side of the argument. I'll admit that. We haven't thrown in the towel completely. Uh, but you hit on the head. Uh, the the ability to produce alpha has to do with the efficiency of the market. If a market is highly efficient, if there are eight analysts covering a large cap stock, there's no in, no information uh, arbitrage. There's no ability to, to know what's going to happen. Everything is instantly priced in the price of that stock because it's known. When you drop down into smaller caps in the USA, you get a lot less coverage, a lot less information flow. And then when you step outside the US and certainly go below the developed markets and go into the emerging markets, um, there there is an information advantage. So you would you will see if you scale down the efficiency if you could create a scale of the efficiency of the public markets around the world you would see our active passive shift change in lockstep with that uh, drop in efficiency now that said we do have some uh, mid cap and small cap active managers in the US uh you go all the way to the extreme of the emerging markets we're almost 100% active almost and it's because you know, those markets are inefficient, information is valuable, uh, and they can make better decisions. Now, they have to make a lot more decisions. When you have 28 countries and industries within those countries, and 28 currencies, by the way, uh, you got a lot of decisions you have to actually get right to be able to outperform the market. But that that's an area that we find an interesting challenge. And then I want to overlay that E, S, and G, uh, so environmental, social, and governance, what the companies do and how they behave is actually really important to us. Um, and particularly when you drop into the non-US and the emerging markets, uh, we want people paying attention to that. Yeah, and I'm going to, I've read your sustainability report, so I'm going to come back a little bit later to ESG. But uh, let's talk about the, the piece of the asset allocation where I can see that you've, you've achieved, your team's achieved quite a lot of alpha, and that's obviously in the private markets or the alternatives, which of course cover a multitude of sins. Um, could we just start by uh, hedge funds and infrastructure? How do you think about them before we then get to PE and VC? Hedge funds and infrastructure, you pick two, two kind of extremes. Um, first, let me describe uh, hedge funds. I have a very strong view that hedge funds are not an asset class. Uh, they are just simply trading vehicles. It's a legal contract. The, the word hedge fund has really become just a, a legal contract of two and 20 and gates. Let's keep in mind there are over 25 flavors of hedge funds, let's, you know, whether you were depending on where you are in the world, but let's think of, of ice cream. There are more than 25 flavors of ice cream. Um, and uh, they do very different things. So uh, I think when you look at that, you have to first recognize it's a inefficient contract structure that's efficient for the GP and inefficient for the LP, but also recognize that, that it is not a uh, a uniform asset class. It's a bunch of different strategies. They generally tend to be trading. They tend to be short-term, uh, quick moves. Uh, some do clearly, uh, you know, they're a handful of the biggest that have produced uh, ridiculous return numbers uh, over the years. Uh, very expensive, if impossible to get into, uh, and opaque. You have no idea what they're doing, uh, which to a lot of people might be fine. I'm a steward of a million teachers' money. I want to be able to tell them what we're invested in. I want to know what we own and what we don't own. Uh, so when I look at the, the myriad of hedge funds, there are some strategies within that that we think actually complement what we do. And believe it or not, we view them as risk mitigating. Uh, they are not correlated with the global equity market. Uh, they're not negatively correlated, so it's not a perfect hedge but they're less correlated. So 
you don't you won't find a hedge fund category in my asset allocation because again i don't believe it's an asset class you will find what people might describe as those strategies in in three of my asset classes uh because they complement what we do i wanted to just talk as i said talk about um the infrastructure of hedge funds because the 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 pe and vc conversation flows together sort of you know as one sort of different so just tell me about infrastructure because it's featuring in your allocation yeah, we believe very strongly. I, I really feel that infrastructure really suits us well, because if you think, you step back and look at us, uh, as you mentioned, we're, we're terribly old, over 100 years old, very long horizon, uh, very patient. You know, we have 300 billion, we have a 35 year horizon. I need cash flow because I have a negative cash flow. So I, I really am long term and patient capital. And, and so big, physical, boring assets that kick off cash are actually beautiful to me. Um, you know, a parking lot, uh, a toll road, uh, a port, an airport. Uh, nowadays, infrastructure has even become uh, cell towers, power lines. You know, it, we own some of the, the biggest boring uh, buried, you know, you don't even see it, but we make money from it. Uh, there are, you know, when you think about that island of, of Manhattan, picture that, the huge amount of people that live on the island of that of Manhattan, y you can only see one or two at best uh, electrical generating plants. Uh, it sounds silly, but it, best analogy is think about their enormous uh, extension cords going under those rivers from New York and New Jersey up into Manhattan to power it. They're buried, you know, 20 feet down in the mud of those rivers. We own a couple of those. And as long as they're there, buried under the mud, somebody pays us to be able to push electricity through them. We don't own the electricity. We just own that big, ugly cable. I love that. Um, just recently in San Francisco, I, I went over a freeway on ramp to the Golden Gate Bridge. Everybody knows the Golden Gate Bridge. Nobody knows the freeway on ramps. Uh, they're actually very beautiful, well, well designed, efficient, built on time. We own those. So as long as they sit there, there's no toll, but as long as they sit there, the state of California pays us a fee for being able to have them. Um, same. So I, I just can't describe enough how I think that's really valuable. Uh, and as I said, long term, patient, boring, but you get a steady cash flow and a return on your money. The big difference between us doing it and say the public sector building that stuff, uh, we maintain it. I mean, people know, taxpayers around the world know that, you know, when the government builds something, that's great, but they often cut, cut back on maintenance and, and don't repaint it or don't keep it up. Uh, and then after 50 years, it starts falling apart. We maintain it so that it's like new when we hand it back. So long story short, I, I, that's why I, sounds silly, but I really do like infrastructure as an institutional investment. Doesn't fit, you know, for, for most retail investors, they can't even find a way to buy it. There isn't a good structure for them. But for us, we can, we can team up with other funds. Uh, and keep in mind, infrastructure, big chunks of capital. These things are expensive uh, sunk capital for a long period of time. Well, I, I have a huge pool of money. So to be able to invest in something and I'll pick on private equity. Great long-term investment, but let's realize I get my money back every seven, eight years out of private equity. I have to redeploy it. Infrastructure, I can put the money there for 15, 20 years and just get cash flow. Got it. So we segue then into PE and VC and you know, you, you're not you worried owe me three dollars for helping you pay for the segue. <sighs> <laughs> Thank you. So, um, so here we are in a potential change of investment climate, which we're going to come on to, you know, in a minute, and a lot of excitement, obviously, in private equity and de 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 declining market cap in a lot of parts of the world as companies have either gone pro private or chosen to stay private for longer, and a lot of euphoria, courtesy of the, you know, the largesse of central banks that is now passing. How have you thought about? Given that you can afford the what, what Swenson would refer to as the illiquidity premium, how can you? How have you thought about those two asset classes? I think they're particularly valuable for long-term investors um, and institutional investors. 
Uh, it's an area that, you know, we're not too dissimilar from, as again, the 35-year-old teacher saving for retirement. Uh, but sadly, she only has access to stocks and bonds through mutual funds. We have the ability to be that long-term patient capital and invest in long-term investments. And and David Swisson was, you know, brilliant. I mean, he he wrote the book. He literally did write the book on on endowment investing and institutional investing and really saw the value of being long-term, being in a private area uh, where you don't need mark to market and you can wait for the return of your capital. Uh, and we know that the compounding is is powerful. So for me, it has uh, it's really been, uh, particularly private equity has been a big alpha driver in, in the funds that I have worked for. Uh, as I mentioned at the state of Washington, they really are one of the early pioneers into private equity. And now they have almost a third of their portfolio, I think over 30% of the portfolio in private equity. Uh, and it has really generated returns uh, historically for them. Uh, and it's because simply, you know, not everything in that industry is, is perfect or well done. Uh, but many of the long-term institutions, uh, think of it this way, when you're a public company, you have a, a 91 day, every 91 days, everybody wants to look in on how you're doing. Think of that as a report card. That's terribly short term, a lot of pressure every 90 days. You may know what you have to do over the next year or, or three years, but it would hurt that 91 day earnings. Most CEOs find it really difficult to make those long-term decisions. But if you're a private company where you don't have to report over that cycle, then you can make those long-term decisions uh, and make those changes and actually improve the health of a company. And I think that transition you, like you're hitting on of, of seeing public companies go private is a big part of that is that arbitrage of thinking short-term versus being able to think long-term. There's a cost arbitrage, but I think that especially it's a long-term, short-term trade-off for them and the ability to invest in a company um, and redeploy earnings back into it really becomes a, a powerful generator of return over time. And given your very clear liabilities, the world of venture capital is less certain axiomatically, but just tell me a little bit how you think and deploy money there. Venture capital is actually a real interesting challenge for us. Uh, you would think here we are in California, you know, 140 kilometers from, from Silicon Valley, uh, we'd have access to, to all the great ones. Uh, the challenge is actually we don't. Um, the, the Number one, they want small investments, not big ones, and I'm big. Uh, they want to diversify their LPs, uh, and they prefer private LPs uh, who are very secretive and quiet, just like they are while I'm public. Everything I do is in the press. And the state of California has decided to approve a bunch of laws that require me to disclose even more to the point that many of the big venture capital firms said, we don't want you as a client. Uh, you know, they found a really nice way to say that, but um, they would rather have other people's money who don't ask questions. And we ask a lot of questions. So uh, it's actually a really small segment in my portfolio, unfortunately. But also, as we've learned, venture capital, while you hear about the spectacular unicorns, uh, you know, nine out of 10 deals uh, are losers or go or break evens. Uh, it really is uh, trying to pull a needle out of a haystack. And that said, some of the firms have actually proven very skillful at, you know, in every fund, finding one or two needles in the haystack, uh, but making 10 times their money on those. Uh, yet we have seen examples even here most recently, I'll pick on FTX, where they put money in, but it, it disappeared. So VC is, is a real high stakes, but also very challenging game. I love it because it's entrepreneurial. It, it, many of the products we take for granted today were started in venture capital. And uh, you know, so it, it is critical, I think, just to humankind as a way to finance innovation and new ideas. Uh, that said, it's a real challenging area to be. We, I would love to have a larger allocation, but it's just, we're not, we just don't fit their world well and vice versa. 
Thank you. That's very honest and very understandable. So we've looked at the map of these assets that you deploy. One of the early things I touched on was the question of agility when you have such a large pool of capital. But we know that there are intersections in the market, be it March 20, be it, you know, maybe the, the shift in central bank's view of, you know, having been too lax with inflation, where risk and opportunity suddenly look, it can be looked at through a, maybe a clearer lens. How agile would you say you can be? I'm going to go back to an analogy you started with, which is the, the big ship in the ocean. Again, I like to say we're a, a big cruise line ship. I can't spin on a dime. At 300 billion, it's very difficult. And being a public fund, it's very difficult to be agile. Uh, if I was a $3 billion endowment, my good friend Colette uh, uh, runs uh, the Williams Endowment. You know, it's a real challenge, but for her, she can shift on a dime. She can, she can invest $100 million and it's meaningful to her balance sheet. To me, $100 million is, is not uh, gonna move the needle. So we'll make subtle shifts. Like I said, we'll batten down the hatches, we'll tilt the portfolio a bit, uh, but I'm gonna ride through those storms. Uh, I would like to be counter cyclical, like you said, March of 20. Uh, I can tell you, because I remember that vividly, uh, as, as the COVID outbreak was starting to suddenly spread uh, and the markets got extremely volatile that we wouldn't limit uh, in the first six minutes of the trading day. Um, I have a smaller tactical team. So a picture of that cruise ship. I call up the key people, the engine room, navigation, communications. We all huddle up in the uh, uh, captain's quarters or the, you know, the front of the ship uh, and, and talk about what we should do. In March of 20, we are actually talking about in the West Coast, because keep in mind here, the stock market opens at, at uh, 6.30. Uh, we were talking at 5 a.m. We were talking again at 7. We talk at 10 and we talk at 1. Um, and most of that was by phone. There were a few people, you know, at that point, several people were in the office. Uh, and then we talk again at about 3 in the afternoon about what we would do the next day. So we have the ability to try to tilt the portfolio. First, initially being defensive, we went into that, thankfully, being a slight underweight, uh, but then starting to be aggressive of coming back in and buy. The challenge is we just did not understand. We knew people were going to shut down the global economy. And normally, if I told you, I know for a fact that in the next two weeks, we are literally going to stop the global economy, you'd probably think that's pretty bad. Uh, the flip side of that is then the Fed turned and dropped the, the, the rate on money to zero, flooded the market with liquidity, and suddenly you have to change your perspective of like, wow, now we're back to zero interest rates. I remember the very first time after 08 where the Fed came out and said they were going to keep interest rates near zero for a prolonged period of time. I called my whole team together, and, and at that point, we'd never seen anything like that in our entire careers. And we had to rethink, what does this mean when borrowing money is almost free, money, you know, risk-free money is zero, interest, zero return, um, and capital was scarce. Uh, and so we would be very, very, you know, we had a view that, that any of our capital had an extreme value to it that was liquid. And whether it was private equity, real estate, fixed income, equity, they all had to compete for it and they all had to, to get a very high rate of return. So you go from basically operating day to day and normal in those environments to suddenly uh, a triage moment and a uh, tighten down and, and meet more frequently and communicate more frequently. It, it, again, we can't spin that ship on a dime. And I'll, I, I laugh because retirees will point out to me that cruise ships have side thrusters now. I had to study that, but I realized they can only use those in port when they're not when they're not going fast. We're out in the open ocean, full speed, so uh, I can't use the side thrusters and spin on a dime. So I'm going to make you know those subtle shifts and those subtle defensive or offensive moves. So let's go back to ESG. I read your sustainability report; it's very credible, and I absolutely get the uh, objectives. I was also intrigued, um, probably reflecting my own biases. Pleased to see, and I'll quote to you: "Divestment is a last resort action, 
that can have a lasting negative impact on the health of the teacher's retirement fund. And I think that's actually, we interviewed Nikolai Tangen of the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund, and he had done an interview explicitly with the CEO of BP talking about why that's, you know, that's a, a company they're working with as BP, like Shell and others, are on their journey. When you've got a large allocation to passive, do you worry your voice can't be heard? No, I worry we'll be ignored. But what it gives me the advantage to do is to sit down with a CEO, and I've had the chance to do this several times, look at them in the face, explain to them that as long as there are public school teachers in the state of California, we're going to own their stock, which means we're going to own their stock a lot longer than they're going to be CEO and the next CEO and the next CEO. So we're not going away. You need to listen to us. We are your long-term capital to this corporation. We own it more than you do, even though you run it day to day. Uh, and you and the board of directors who we elect need to listen to us uh, because we're a consistent voice. We're not just gonna quit and go away, uh, which is what they often say. If you don't like my company, then sell the stock and go away. And my answer to them is no, no, we're not. Um, it's true, we may own less during some times and more during other times, but generally, we're not going away. That's had a profound impact. Most CEOs don't think that there's really long-term capital unless there's a family owner or a, a large, profound uh, founder. In our case, it's a whole new area and it really has caught their attention to, to I remember one CEO stopped and said, wait a minute, you're telling me you're not gonna sell my stock, you're still gonna be here after I'm gone? And we're like, yeah. And the same issues we have with you, we're going to have an excellent with the next CEO. Um, and sure enough, we heard from investor relations the next day that they wanted to establish a better relationship because uh, up to that point, it had not been good. So I, I think we're getting a better voice. Uh, institutional investors are singing together. So we're a louder chorus. And I think that's powerful uh, because individual solos are, are nice. But, you know, uh, the CEOs can divide and conquer. Um, but when they hear a loud chorus of voices, they have to pay attention because the uh, shareholder votes now are starting because retail is waking up and starting to vote alongside us. We put out our votes and let everybody know. Um, so I think we're trying to be very good corporate stewards uh, because I want these companies to survive. I, I, if I'm going to own them for 30 or 40 years, I, I want them to succeed. Uh, and, I, and I'm long term, so I don't care about 91 days. I want them to succeed three years, five years, 10 years. You know, there, there's amazing stories of, of 120, 200 year old companies that suddenly get destroyed and disappear. That's really sad. That shouldn't happen. Uh, you know, companies need to adapt and survive. And, and we want that long term. It's good for society. It's good for us. So. Um, we're very a very loud, uh, vocal, but I think a solid business partner with corporations, with other institutional investors. Many of the people you mentioned that you've got in this lineup, we're good friends with and we talk to regularly. Uh, they're experts in their local markets um, and sometimes they'll take the lead and we team up with them. Uh, sometimes we'll take the lead and they team up with us. But, but how a company behaves and makes its money, I want them to make money but how they make their money, I want them to. I want it to be very long term. I don't want them to cut corners just for short term profit. That doesn't do me any good. I need to make money next year and the year after that. So we tell CEOs all the time that cutting corners to make return, you know, it, if you're thinking in 91 day seg segments, knock it off. You need to think beyond your career horizon, and and that's hard. CEOs' careers are typically three to six years, uh, four to six years, uh, and we're going to own it longer. But People get pretty worked up nowadays about the initials E, S, and G. But if you think of it as sustainability, long-term corporate uh, profit, uh, I often say, forget the initials, we're getting lost in acronyms. Long-term business risk, that's what I care about. Long-term business risks, and if you ask CEOs in their language, their, their eyes are absolutely focused. They hire consultants to help them understand those long-term business risks. Boards measure it and look at it. Uh, and my answer is, yeah, that, I can translate almost all of those into E, S, or G issues. 
uh, they just, again, get lost in the acronyms. Got it. Well, I think you have provided some really terrific insights into not just how you operate, but how one thinks about you know, very long-term uh, stewardship of capital. So I'm just going to ask you a few closing questions, if I may. What advice would you give to a 20-year-old Chris Aylman? Um, Eat better. Don't <laughs> gain weight. Exercise more. And I would say, by God, take care of those knees. Don't ever ski again. Ruin my knees. Um, you know, that's a challenge because uh, I'm not 20, so it's hard to have that perspective. Uh, I, I do mentor a lot of the younger staff, and, I, and we have summer interns that I teach on a regular basis. Um, I'm still a big fan of institutional investing. I think that's an exciting career. It suits me because it's long term. Uh, I often tell young people, you know, the first thing you actually have to do is really figure out who you are. Come up with three or four things that that in your life define who you are, which is awfully hard for a young person to, to picture long term. What do I want to be known for? What's going to be the most important thing to me personally? But But list those four things. Don't forget them. Keep looking back at them. Uh, because you have different pressures in life, and oftentimes you end up sacrificing what might have been your main goal, uh, and, and you just want to keep your eyes on that long term. Uh, I think sustainability and and long term investing are absolutely uh, wonderful careers. Uh, certainly, you know, there's no question to a 20 year old, the biggest mega trend that is going to impact their life right now is going to be climate change. The second is demographics, but the first is going to be climate change. And they absolutely have to learn it and understand it uh, because we're going to have stronger weather storms, droughts, rain, hurricanes, winds, temperature. Everything is going to get more extreme every year uh, just without, unfortunately, uh, without slowing and probably accelerating. Um, the second thing is demographics. You know, if you're 20 right now, you're at the end of an enormous population uh, boom. Um, you need to understand the demographics is destiny and, and study that. Uh, and I think the other thing that they would want to learn or understand better is, is geopolitics. Um, not enough people uh, travel the world and see the world. Where, where many of the people, particularly in the United States, are way too insulated. Um, uh, but I think I would say travel the world, understand history better, uh, and that may help you understand China and the U.S. because the relationship of China and the U.S. in the next 30 years is going to be absolutely profound. And my final question to you is that this business, although you've done a very good job overseeing um, casters, can at times be very disheartening when the performance is into your face and things aren't going well. H how do you, how have you dealt with those periods? I get on my knees. Um, you know, I, I would tell people, and I, I do tell the young people that losing other people's money is actually one, uh, by far the toughest thing to do. It just is, uh, it just hollows you out. It, it hurts in the heart. And, you know, I remember 08 vividly. Uh, it's like a black hole in my life. Uh, and I remember talking to the staff about, you know, we're going to dig this fund out of, you know, we're, we're going to get back on top. We're going to dig out of this hole um, and, and asking people to commit. Uh, and I think that's one thing is to look on that. It, it, another is to understand that it's going to happen. Um, you know, this is a business. If you look back in history all the way back, you have U.S. stock prices all the way back to the 1860s, uh, global stocks even uh, in some markets longer, but most less so. Uh, you know there are going to be uh, air pockets, um, potholes, where suddenly just the floor drops out. Uh, but you also know on the other side of those, oftentimes, uh, you're going to recover. It's going to take some time, but you will recover, so you can dig yourself out. Uh, you know, those potholes, you know the analogy that the stock market drops down an elevator shaft, but it climbs the stairs. You know, they're fast, they're furious, uh, they're unbelievable, uh, but you have to keep your wits about you. Or as Warren says, when everybody is greedy, be frightened. When everyone's frightened, be greedy. 
It's incredibly hard to do. It sounds silly, but it is so hard to do. Um, and, and I think of that. Uh, even right now, there's geopolitical risks around the world. Uh, the central banks around the world are raising interest rates. We're fighting inflation. Everyone's predicting a recession in 23. Um, so are we going to have one of those pothole events? Uh, my team is already trying to build up cash to think of the uh, buying down, buying low, the opportunities, which is great. Um, it is the biggest challenge. It's so hard. Uh, it just takes the, again, I can't say it enough. It, it takes the wind out of your, the breath out of your lungs. Um, but you have to think long term. Uh, you have to get back to the basics of what you're trying to do and achieve. But again, I'm making those, those subtle course corrections, you know, batten down the hatches and then start actually coming in and buying when you realize there's maybe a little stability, a little light on the horizon. Uh, but then when everything is sunny and wonderful, um, you'd actually find that's many times when I'm the most nervous, when when everybody's having, uh, you know, a Mai Tai on the deck, uh, I'm looking around for the clouds on the horizon. Never as good as it seems or as bad as people fear. But anyway, there's a great place to stop there, Christopher. Thank you. Um, two pieces of your advice I'm going to summarize as we always do. If you're young and thinking about careers, get your arms around those mega trends of climate change and demographics. And number two is the most important thing when people get uh, overly absorbed in the whole ESG debate is that if you're providing long-term capital, it's the sustainability of that business that is absolutely key. And I think that is often overlooked as well. So with that, Christopher, I'm going to say thank you very much again. It's been great talking to you. Um, I know you've actually got some bad weather in California, so maybe we're more like London today. Um, but this has been terrific.